one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Gospel of John, chapter 
John chapter 6, verse 21 verses. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a, a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. And finally, this reading from... Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 3, beginning with the 14th verse. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is the bread of life, and by eating of him we have everlasting life and great treasures and blessings as God himself fills us by his spirit and renews us throughout souls. Let's take a moment then to meditate on our shorter catechism lesson, which comes to us from questions numbers 82 and 83 from the catechism 
I'll read them for you, and then direct some comments to the topics there. Question 82 is, is any man able perfectly to keep the commandments of God? The answer, no mere man since the fall is able in this life perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but the daily break them in thought, word, and deed. Question 83, are all transgressions of the law equally heinous? The answer, some sins in themselves and by reason of several aggravations are more heinous in the sight of God than others. In his Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus explained his relationship to the law of Moses. There was a question about whether Jesus had come to upend the law of Moses, to reject the law, and establish a new kingdom with a new law. Jesus shows us that he did not come to subvert the law of Moses, but to support, enforce, to fulfill the law. That is to say, he would explain the proper meaning of that law and its application to us. In the course of his sermon, where he exposes the law of God, talks about murder, adultery, uh, lying, uh, false oaths, all these kinds of things, he makes this statement, you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so as he reviews the law, he shows how the law, as we've considered already, the law not only addresses our outward conduct, but also our inward thoughts, motivations, desires, all these things come under the scrutiny of God's word, his law. And should we fail just within the heart, to maintain the perfection that God requires, then we are sinners who have broken the law of God and subject to the judgments of the law. Jesus says, you shall be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, who among us can say that when I reflect on God's law, my duty to God, my duty to my neighbor, my own obligations to life and so forth, who among us can say, I have lived a perfect life? Now, there have been some who have suggested that they've done just that. In fact, it was John Wesley who, for a time at least, believed in the perfection of the, the Christian. Now, by living a Christian life, one could do away with sin in their life. And when asked, uh, John Wesley said, I have not sinned for years and years. Who? You can only do that either by reducing the demands of God's law, minimizing them to a, a place where you think you can observe them faithfully, and that generally means the most narrow interpretation of law on external terms. Do not commit murder. Okay, well, I haven't murdered anybody yet. Do not commit adultery. Well, I haven't committed adultery yet. So I'm perfect, right? So you minimize the standards of God's law and externalize them and in that way try to escape the force of the law of God. Uh, the other pattern would be simply to explain away the law of God, say it no longer holds, and what counts is love, an amorphous feeling that I have for God and for others, and as long as I have that feeling of love for others and try to do things out of that love, then I am living a perfect life. Well, love is the fulfillment of the law. And so there is a, a tie-in, a connection between love and the law. But love always abides by that law and keeps the commands that God gives to us. So we cannot escape the extensive demands of God's law. So who is perfect? Scriptures make it very clear that none of us are perfect, that we are sinners, that we've all broken the law of God and done so in magnificent fashion, if you can put it that way. Think not only of the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, and first thing out of the Garden of Eden is Cain murdering his brother Abel, but then you have the descent of mankind into violence and corruption.
corruption, so much so that God says to Noah that uh, he's going to destroy the earth and all mankind because every intention of their thoughts is only evil continually. Not just their actions, but their thoughts. It's only evil continually. And so God judged that first world with a massive, and my view is a global flood. And it hasn't gotten any better after the flood. You might think, well, people learned their lesson, but not so. God's judgments do not change the human heart. It continues in its rebellion. And so it is when we read into the Psalms and the Apostle Paul quotes from the Psalms. And Paul says in Romans chapter 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. They have all become corrupt. And so the thought of perfection escapes us. It's beyond our ability to achieve. There is no one who can stand before God and say, I am innocent of all sin. So if we have all sinned, then we are accountable to God's law, accountable to God's judgment, and must be punished to that end. Thankfully, there is one person who has kept God's law perfectly from the heart, even our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is His perfection that becomes ours through faith. And so when we stand before God, it's not on the basis of our good works, things that we might do to achieve God's favor, but it's rather because God looks at Jesus in our place. And it's His perfection, His righteousness, that becomes ours. And in so doing, we have all that we need in order to stand before God. Try to address this very briefly. The next question is: Are there transgress all transgressions of the law equally heinous? Heinous is perhaps not a word that we use too often, but uh, it might be said: it, Are they equally terrible, awful, disgusting, uh, offensive? Are, are they of the same level? Well, uh, any sin is a sin against God. So no matter what you do towards your neighbor, it is also and primarily a sin against God. And so David says in Psalm 51, it's against you and you only have I sinned when he considers his sin with Bathsheba. And so that very earthly human connection that David formed and the sin that he committed uh, without thought of God was actually, first of all, primarily a sin against God. And any sin against God has infinite consequences in view of the fact that it is a sin against God. And so it's not just something that a few amends can fix or atone for. It's a sin of an infinite quality because it's a sin and offense against the infinitely eternal, loving, good God. So therefore, one might say that all sins are evil and wicked. Uh, at the same time, we know that there are some sins that are more uh, damaging, uh, hurtful, painful, evil than others. The sins that you might have in your heart may have less impact than the sins that you might have upon others by actually carrying out the thoughts of your heart. And so, uh, there is uh, a dramatic escalation of uh, your sin when it gets beyond the heart and what you're thinking about and uh, works itself out into life. So these are things that we need to be mindful of. Uh, the, the sins of the heart, perhaps not as serious as the sins of the tongue uh, or the things that we might do, but all the same, we are accountable to God for that which we do. So we'll finish our meditation there on the Catechism, and we'll uh, continue at this moment with a time of prayer. And before I do, uh, John, if that chair is more comfortable, you can turn that around and put it in the aisle for that if that's what you want, then that'll be fine. Let's take a moment to pray and bring our requests to the Lord. 
Father in heaven, we do thank you for your mercies to us. We thank you that though you have seen us in our sin and in our rebellion, you were pleased to have mercy on us. And by your grace, you sent your Son to redeem us from sin, to deliver us from evil, to take out our hearts of stone and give us a heart of flesh that responds to you. And we thank you that with that heart of flesh, now we run to you, trusting in your word and your promises, and flee to Christ, resting in him and his good work on our behalf. We do acknowledge our sin, O oh Lord. We acknowledge that we sin daily. We fall far short of your perfect standards. And we do pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us for our sins, those things that we've thought about, the things that we've said, and the things that we've done. Pray that you would wash us and cleanse us of all these many things and renew us by your grace that we might love and serve you more perfectly. Strengthen us that we might walk more faithfully before you day after day. We thank you for your mercies to us and your faithfulness to us in spite of our corruption and sin. Lord, we do pray for uh, our church and for our extended families. We pray that your spirit would minister to the needs of each one. We pray that you would uh, continue your hand of healing for uh, Mary Pauline's uh, sister-in-law. We thank you that she went through her surgery well. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue your healing hand upon her. And as Dan awaits surgery on his eyes, we pray, Lord, that you would watch over him and bless him. Uh, we pray for the Hamels in New York and Thank you for them, their trust in you, and their desire to honor you and your word by fellowshipping with your people here. We do pray that though they are at a distance, that your hand of blessing will be on them, that you would strengthen them by your word and spirit. We pray, Lord, that our fellowship, though at a distance, would nonetheless be sweet and a blessing to each to each other. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with the various ministries of our church, and we thank you for our Bible studies during the week and pray that you would cause them to be effective and fruitful. We pray that you would strengthen us and disciple us to be bond servants of the Lord. Those who walk uh, in the calling that you have for us with joyful hearts, humbly serving the Lord Jesus. We pray for your blessing on us as we serve you. Father, we pray that you would bring healing to those who are ill, strengthen those who are weak, we pray, Lord, that you would watch over those who are aged. We pray, Lord, that you would protect them from harm, keep them from all fall. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and kindness to each one. And we pray that you would look after them in your love and favor. We commit them to you, the good shepherd of the sheep. We pray that you would watch over all of us as we travel through this life. That whether we are elderly or young and strong, Lord, help us to trust in you for at any moment we may appear before you. We pray, Lord, that you would then sustain us in life and grant us your blessing. Father, we pray for our Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We thank you for its ministries, its pastors, its uh, sessions, and congregations across the country. We thank you for those who are, you are calling to yourself even this day. We pray for your blessing on the ministry of your word. We pray that you would cause your church to abound. We pray that the glory of Christ will be manifest to us again, and that your glory would shine forth uh, from pulpit to pulpit. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen those who open your word this day. Father, we pray for other churches of like faith. We pray that you would bless them and encourage them in your word. And we pray for others who uh, have drifted from your word. We pray, Lord, that you would bring repentance and faith, that you would teach them and instruct them from your word. And we pray that you would provide for a greater unity and truth and spirit and love. Father, we pray that you would be with our country. We thank you for it and for its great history. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember your great works on our behalf over the course of the years. And we pray, Lord, that you would be at work in our country today, deliver us from evil, strengthen us in the fight against the evil, to do that which is right and good. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, bring your judgments to bear on those who are uh, hostile to your church and to your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that you would remove them from the way, and that you would advance your kingdom in every aspect of our culture and life. We pray, Lord, that those in our uh, 
news media, in our entertainment industry, those in government, those in uh, sports, those in business, uh, those in our hospitals and, and medical facilities, Lord, in our educational institutions, we pray that there be a great and general repentance for our rebellion against you, for our idolatry in worshiping, serving the creature rather than the creator. We pray, Lord, for a great nationwide repentance for our sins. We pray, Lord, that you would bring about this by your spirit and pray that you would bring a great change, that many would come to turn from these empty, foolish things to embrace the truth as it is in Jesus Christ and follow him and glorify him. And may we as a mighty nation proclaim the gospel of Christ to the nations of the earth and overcome them by the power of your word and spirit. We ask for your blessing upon your church. And Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We pray that you tend to our earthly needs, strengthen us and provide for us, and teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's turn to our next hymn. Hymn number 48, O Lord Most High, with all my heart. Hymn number 48.
seventh plague, and they all the plague of hell, and the wheat that have the spirit. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself, and on your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never has been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field to save shelter. For every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh carried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast, and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire and ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail very heavy hail, such as has never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field, in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. Thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord, God. The flax and the barley were struck down. For the barley was in the ear, the flax was in bud, but the wheat and the emmer were not struck down, for they were late in coming up. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to the Lord. The thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned again. He sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go just as the Lord has spoken through Moses. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its very serious judgments on the kingdom of men. We pray, Lord, that as we consider another of your plagues against Egypt, that you would humble our hearts, help us to rest in you, help us to rejoice in your great work in the earth, and pray, Lord, that you would bless us and provide for us. We ask you.
does seem to be a, a bit of an order to the plagues that we have developing before us. There are three sets of three plagues that come to us, and each are kind of structured in the same way. The first, fourth, and seventh plagues are uh, follow a typical pattern. That pattern is that Moses goes to meet Pharaoh, perhaps at the Nile River, and there he talks to him about God's judgments. He explains what God is going to do. Warns him in advance. And then the plague comes right there before Pharaoh's eyes. Pharaoh responds. He uh, repents, if you will, uh, and, and says bargains in some way about letting Israel go. And so there is this pattern on the first, fourth, and seventh plagues of, of a rather extended account of what takes place. You get to the, the second, fifth, and eighth plagues. Moses again appears before Pharaoh, but the account is rather shorter and briefer. Pharaoh explains what's going to happen, and then there is the plague, and that's about the account. And finally, the, the third member of each of these triads, third plague, uh, third, sixth, and ninth plagues, uh, each of them is abrupt, each of them is without introduction. There's nothing about Moses and Aaron going before Pharaoh to talk to him about what's about to take place. No, there is an intensity in that third plague of the set of plagues. And so this plague of the hail now introduces the third set of plagues, which largely have to do with God's, the Lord's dominion over the heavens, the skies above. And so the first set of plagues, there was a demonstration with the gods of Egypt in the Nile. God showed that he is the one who is in control of the waters of the earth, not the gods of Egypt. And so he turns the water to blood. Then the frogs come up out of the, the waters. And then you've got the third plague, which escapes me at the moment. That's, and so the gnats, some suggest there is a development of the gnats from the, the dead frogs. They kind of come up out of the dead carcasses of the frogs all over the place, and then they also, so it's repercussions from God's plagues on the Nile River. Frogs flee the Nile and come across. And so the Lord is the God of, of the waters of the earth and the source of life. Second, we saw the God is the Lord of the earth. He has dominion over the things that take place on the land. And so the plagues that come out of that, the, the flies, the uh, plague, the, the boils, uh, come from uh, things on earth, on the land, and affect the land creatures. Now we have God's plagues upon the heavens, showing that He rules the heavens as well. And you can see uh, an increased tempo and, and uh, certainly greater severity now as you get to this last triad of plagues. When the Lord demonstrates that He's the Lord of the heavens above. And so in this seventh plague, which introduces plagues that will also include the locusts that come across, cover the skies, the darkness that uh, covers the earth so much that people can't see even their hand in front of them. Uh, these things show that the Lord is the God of the heavens. And the gods of the heavens in the Egyptian pantheon, Newt and Shu and another one as well, um, they are rejected and shown to be of no power. The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, is the God of the heavens, and he rules over all. And so he uses the powers of the heavens to bring judgments upon Egypt. The very things that the gods are supposed to control for the good of Egypt, God uses against them. So he demonstrates his tremendous power. Uh, one interesting thing that you'll note from the, the previous uh, couple of plagues is that you have Moses and Aaron taking fistfuls of uh, ash from the kiln. And they stand before a pharaoh and they throw that up into the, the sky. And that's what covers the sky uh, with um, flies. And so there's a reaction to the uh, slavery of the Jews in Egypt, how at these brick kilns, they had to manufacture these bricks for Egypt. 
And now God is where reminds Egypt of what they imposed upon uh, Israel by uh, this act of Moses and Aaron by taking the, 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 uh, the ashes from the kilns and throwing it up into the heavens. Here, God calls upon Moses and Aaron to appear before Pharaoh and to, to declare another round of judgments. And now things are becoming much more intense. We saw in the previous uh, plague that uh, the, the magicians could not imitate that which God had done, just in the, in the gnats that came and filled the earth. They couldn't make a gnat. Seems like a harmless, innocent little thing to be able to do if you can do other things, but uh, God prevented them from doing that. And they said, well, this is the finger of God. By the finger of God, this has occurred. Now God says to Pharaoh, and in Egypt there was a tremendous uh, amount of literature that talked about the hand of the Pharaoh as, as bringing blessing to Egypt, and the hand of the Pharaoh protecting Egypt from their enemies. There was an exaltation of Pharaoh's hand. Now God says, by my hand I will bring hail upon the earth. They bring these great storms upon the earth. So it's not the finger of God at work now, it's God's hand at work. So there's an escalation of the warfare. Just as it moves from earth to heaven, it moves from finger to hand. And indeed, God says in the course of this, that if I had wanted to, I could have already wiped you out. I could have sent a plague that would have killed everyone. So God was showing amazing restraint upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh. In the face of their pride and arrogance, in the face of their rebellion, God could have destroyed them, but he was pleased to withhold his wrath. And indeed, to hold him up, to sustain him, so that God could continue to bring his plagues upon Egypt. We have here an interesting commentary on the corruption of the human heart and the way that God relates to that, especially in view of God's purposes of election and how he hardens the sinner's heart who rebels against the Lord. Those who hear perhaps the gospel and hear it time and time again and yet rebel against it, resist it, and go on their own way, hardening their hearts against these kinds of things, God may give them over to greater sins, hardening their hearts even more as an act of judgment. So, even that little bit that they possess, to borrow the language of one of Christ's parables, even that which they possess was taken away from them. They're given over into their sins. And so God takes Pharaoh and holds him up and sustains him while he brings his plagues upon Pharaoh. The Lord strengthened him. I'm mindful of an illustration that Cornelius Fantilli used to use and talk to his students at Westminster Seminary. He talked about how he was traveling, I think, on a bus, and he saw a father with his child, and the child was sitting in his lap. And what did the child do? The child was in a bad mood, as children can be, and the child was slapping his father. And Fantilli looked at that, and he thought, how much does this explain the human heart? We rebel against God, we slap at God, but we're only able to do that because we are in the lap of God and God sustains us. And so when you look at the world around us and you see all the corruption, the wickedness, the blasphemy, and all these kinds of things, the idolatry that takes place, how are they able to do what they do? Except that God is merciful and is patient and allows them to continue on in their sins for His greater purposes. God has a number of purposes in line with Pharaoh in the way that He holds him up and brings His plagues upon Egypt. It's so that Pharaoh might know that there was no one greater than the Lord in the earth. And so as these plagues come upon Pharaoh, it's like uh, God punching at him time and again Pharaoh is to learn some important lessons. In fact, when, when God 
instructs Moses and Aaron to talk to Pharaoh about this. He says that uh, these plagues will strike your, you, your very person. In Hebrew, it is, it will strike you apart. The plagues now are becoming intense. And he is going to deal with Pharaoh's heart, the hardness of his heart. So Pharaoh is going to himself personally feel the weight of these plagues. It's not something that he can dismiss because it mostly impacts the, the lowly people of Egypt, but he's safe in his palace on the whole. No, these affect him significantly. And you'll find later when, uh, the, when the plague comes, he's begging for relief from uh, Moses and from the Lord. So, God intends to instruct Pharaoh. It's as though he's going to put him in his classroom and give him some lessons here. Whether he will listen or not is another matter. But God is going to show him, first of all, that there is no other God besides me on the earth. He alone is unique. All these gods that you have been worshiping and serving bring no benefit to you. And so God demonstrates his uniqueness to Pharaoh. When you consider the glory of God and consider his nature, he truly is unique in terms of God's relationship to all of the so-called gods of the earth. You think of the various gods that people worship. They're all part of this world source. They're, they're all part of this life. They're limited in their powers. They can only do so much. God himself is independent of the creation, ever living, eternal. He is the personal triune God. There's no God like him. And so God gives Pharaoh some lessons. Further, he wishes that God's name would be known throughout the earth. As people see these great plagues that God brings upon Egypt, they will see that the, the God of the Hebrews is indeed a powerful God. In fact, when Israel comes to the land of Canaan and begins to attack, uh, they are frightened by the prospect of the Hebrews coming into the land because they have heard about the plagues that came upon Egypt. And they're frightened that this God has come. So God wishes His name to be known across the earth. It's not really for the value of an, an impression. It's rather that the nations of the earth might repent and turn to this God for their salvation. And so as the gospel of Christ goes out into the world, as the message of, of salvation goes out, it reminds us that God is one who judges the wicked and punishes evil. And this warns the wicked that they must repent and be reconciled to God. And then it reminds them of God's mercies, of how He saved Israel and delivered them from Egypt. Why not call upon this God to be saved? So God had some lessons for Pharaoh that He wanted him to learn through these plagues that was bringing upon him. We find in the 22nd verse here that God uh, tells Moses to lift up his hands to the heavens. He call upon the heavens to bring out this great storm of hail, of fire, of thunder. And so this magnificent storm comes on the following day, sweeping across Egypt at a certain period of time. Calvin in his commentary notes that uh, no one can exactly tell when a storm is going to hit. Today we have supercomputers and we can have some idea of when things can happen. It's pretty amazing to me when I look at my iPhone and I see you're going to get rain in 13 minutes. Or uh, you know, you're at risk of a uh, severe thunderstorm. Uh, but it, at, at this time, no one was able to tell when a storm was going to approach, especially when you're looking out and it's a beautiful day like we have today. Who's to say that tomorrow is going to be a magnificent hailstorm? Moses is instructed by God to lift up, stretch up his arms to the heavens, 
fall for the scale upon Egypt. And there would be a massive storm. In some ways, it, it reminds us of the storm of God, God himself coming to Egypt. You remember that when Israel appeared to Moses, uh, to the Lord at Mount Sinai, the Lord descended upon the mountain with thunder and uh, lightning and great fire, uh, the sound of the trumpet. There is a, a sense of majesty in the presence of God. And so God is at war with the gods of Egypt. And he will come and bring this plague upon Egypt and devastate the land of Egypt. So much so that it's said that uh, there's, been, there's never been a plague like it in all the history of Egypt. One commentator said that Egypt had its national beginnings in about the year 3100 BC. So we're talking about, about uh, 1600 years or more history. So, and, and incidentally, uh, apparently in Egypt there is this kind of a, a rhetoric where they talk about something being done by the Pharaoh is greater than it has ever been done in all of Egypt. And so God is using the language of the Egyptians against them, saying, I'm going to bring a plague against you that will be bigger than anything you've ever seen in all the land of Egypt. Um, as I mentioned that they talk much about the hand of Pharaoh. Also, the heart of Pharaoh was considered to be the place where great things happened in Egypt because he was a god. And God says, I'm going to attack your heart. At every point, God is dismantling Egypt and their faith in their gods. He is destroying Pharaoh right before their very eyes. Everything that they took pride in, God is destroying. Pharaoh has a, a, a snake on it, his mitre there. God has the rod of Aaron swallow up the snakes of Egypt. Uh, in every way, God is dismantling Pharaoh right before him, before the eyes of everyone there. And indeed, in a moment, we're going to have Pharaoh, as we're groveling before Moses and Aaron, pleading to for forgiveness, saying, this time I have sinned. You know, this time I really did it. I really messed up this time. Please forgive me. And that was unheard of in Egypt. The Pharaoh doesn't sin. And so the Pharaoh doesn't ask for forgiveness. But here he does. In every way, God is dismantling Pharaoh, undermining him, reducing him. And so Moses lifts up arms to the heavens and God conducts his warfare against Egypt and these great hailstones coming upon Egypt. When we go through uh, scripture we find that God uh, on other occasions also makes use of hell in his warfare against the pagan nations of the earth. Joshua and his armies as they were doing battle with the Amalekites came to rescue the Gibeonites who were pagans, but they had deceived Israel, making a compact with them, but in any case, Joshua comes to deliver them. They march all night to the surprise of the Malachites, then they go into battle with the Malachites, and in the course of the warfare, God rains hailstones upon the Malachites. And the scriptures record that there were, there were more Malachites killed by the hell than there were by the soldiers of Israel. And this history of God's work in Egypt these plagues, in certain respects, coming to a climax here with this plague of hell, is uh, recaptured in Psalm 18, where the psalmist speaks of how he is under the control of those who are greater than, mightier than him. And he cries out to the Lord, and the Lord hears him from his heavenly temple. And he comes on the wings of the wind, in the great storm cloud, with thunder and lightning and hail to rescue his servant. And as you go through that psalm, you see that the national Israel becomes uh, personalized in an individual. And the experiences of Israel and Egypt are the experiences of the Christ. It's spoken at the end of the psalm that the Lord will have mercy upon David and upon his descendants thereafter. It's an anticipation of the coming son of David and his experiences 
where God would come to rescue him from those who are mightier than him. And so as Jesus goes to the cross, suffers the torments of death at the cross, he cries out to the Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God doesn't forsake him. But after his death, he comes and rescues him from the grave, raises him from the dead, delivers him from those who are powerful in this world. Indeed, in the course of Jesus' ministry, he says to his disciples, that I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And so Satan, who dwelt in the courts of, of heaven at the time of Job, talking with the, the sons of, of God at that time, he's cast down, his power is diminished. Christ has risen. He's ascended into heaven with glory and power. And in the 16th chapter of the Apocalypse in the book of Revelation, there are these plagues that come from heaven, including a great hailstorm that comes upon the kingdom of Antichrist. And that great storm comes at the end of history and time, when there are hailstones that are 100 pounds in weight that come down and crush many. Now, I'm not sure what all that means. Are we to understand that literally as some tremendous storm at the end of history where God judges the Antichrist and all those associated with him? Maybe it's spiritually to be interpreted as a great judgment at the end of history and time of natural consequences. Talk about global warming and climate change. Uh, God has his own form of that. In any case, the Lord makes war with the kingdom of Antichrist in this world today and brings his judgments upon the earth to rescue us as he left from the evil of this world. When the hail came upon Egypt, it came upon all of Egypt, but it did not come upon Goshen, where the Jews were living at that time. God spared his people, separated them from the, from the judgments. So you have God's work of election, his distinguishing grace, where he sets apart his people. In the previous play, the same thing occurred. Israel was separated, and Pharaoh actually went to see if that's what had happened. He doesn't do it this time, but he checked it out. And in fact, Israel did not experience the plague upon them. God's love is upon his elect. He sets them apart from the rest of the world. These are the ones that he brings to himself. In the end, as I have mentioned, Pharaoh makes what seems to be, outwardly, a very full confession of his sin. I have sinned. And done that which is evil. Me and my servants. They acknowledge it. We've had enough of thunder and lightning. <laughs> you can imagine. They're tired of it. Make it go away. That was the concern. Make it go away. And so what happens is that he asked for Moses to he asked for Moses to pray for him. And Moses again agrees to pray for Pharaoh. So he, he uh, asked for God to spare him, and God in fact does spare him and uh, ends the plague, knowing full well that Pharaoh was not sincere, God ends the plague. So we can see something of God's great work and the compassion that he has even for the wicked in the world and how he uh, restrains his wrath so that they might have the occasion to repent. And while the nations of the earth were under demonic powers for centuries, there will come a time when the gospel will go to all the nations of the earth through Christ. And now today, God calls everyone to come to faith in Christ, that they might be saved and delivered. May that day come with great power and glory, and may many hear the gospel call. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and pray that your spirit would bless us to our hearts, strengthen us that we might serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's respond to the goodness of the Lord by bringing before him our morning times and honors.
that you provide for us, and we pray that you would receive our offerings to your glory and praise, and that you would build your church here and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing and we'll sing our final hymn, Around the Throne of God in Heaven. Hymn number 500. Is that 543?